Good evening, Woodstock Church of Christ family. Uh, it's good to be with you again. Uh, I'm Stan Butt. I'm the preacher for the Peachtree City Church of Christ. Uh, about three and a half years we've uh, been here, moved down here from Tennessee. Um, and I want to introduce what we're going to be talking about, uh, and then we will. Uh, then I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and then we'll get uh, uh, obviously into our lesson tonight as we continue your study of the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians uh, chapter 5. I have the pleasure tonight of being able to address the qualities of uh, goodness and faithfulness. Uh, I don't know how in the world we're going to uh, study goodness and faithfulness to the uh, degree that it deserves to be studied in 35 or 40 minutes, but we're going to do our best and maybe uh, try to think about some things maybe that we haven't thought about before or maybe think of them uh, in a way uh, that we haven't thought about them before or uh, just be reminded of some good things um, that we already know. That's an important part of preaching to be reminded of things. It's always good to be with you. Of course, uh, this year we're not doing that in, in person. And uh, I know that uh, you are probably, you know, I hate to say getting used to it because I, I don't really want us to get used to it, right? I want us to get back to where we are able to meet together safely and, and comfortably and, and to clasp each other's hand and give each other hugs and those things that uh, brothers and sisters in Christ ought to, ought to uh, be doing. It's been a big year uh, for for my family, uh, of course, I'll tell you a little bit about myself just to remind you. Um, Tennessee is really my, my home state. Grew up in Tennessee, spent most of my life in Tennessee. Uh, I was the preacher for the um, Chapel Hill Church of Christ for 17 years. Now, most of you know uh, Aubrey Johnson and that he was the longtime preacher here at Peachtree City. Well, coincidentally, while I was at Chapel Hill for 17 years, Aubrey was at Peachtree City for those exact same 17 years. And when he left to go to Tennessee, I left Tennessee to come to come down here. So we kind of passed each other on on the highway. Um, this is not my first time to live in, in Georgia, though. When I graduated from David Lipscomb in the spring of 1995, um, I came to Emory Law School and uh, spent a year in law school here in Atlanta. Went to the Avondale Church, Great Avondale Church, met some uh, wonderful people, people who we go to church with now. Actually, one of them is my, my elders now. We met Ken and Suzette uh, Weinhart. We met Brian and April Adams. We were all young kids at the time, didn't, didn't, have, didn't have kids of our own. Um, and, and so we, we had a good time during uh, that time that I was at uh, Emory Law School. Uh, at the end of that year, I got a call from a church in, in Tennessee who asked me if I'd be interested in being their youth minister. And so what happened was I, I, I left law school to go into full-time ministry and, and haven't, uh, haven't really looked back since. Uh, again, I was uh, uh, there for 17 years and just and so that looked like a long-term thing. But, you know, our kids had, our kids had grown up in the church and they, they'd got grown. <laughs> I mean, they, they were literally leaving the house to go to college and, and my wife Georgia and I looked at each other and said, Hey, if, if we're ever going to go anywhere, this is a good time. This is a good time to do it. So when they graduated from high school, uh, the timing was right and we were able to come here and uh, it's been a, been a great transition. So it's been a big year for us. My younger daughter, Grace Ann just started her, uh, last year at, uh, Freed Hardeman university. And she, uh, is studying, uh, to go to dental school. She took her dental, uh, uh, aptitude test or whatever it's called, DAT. And um, so she's been applying uh, to dental school. She's been working at a uh, dentist office here that one of our uh, deacons owns. And uh, so so it's a big year for her, her last year of college. My older daughter, Emma, uh, was married on May 30th. She graduated from, from uh, Freed Hardeman as well uh, in May. Uh, and then got married at the end of that month. So her husband also graduated, um, and uh, they are in Huntsville. She's a nurse, and he's a he's a financial uh, planner, uh, and uh, she's working in the hospital, and she's loving it. So so we have one married got got the wedding, and if you've never done a COVID wedding, uh, then it's a whole it's a whole new ball game. I know any any wedding is a is a is a whole new ball game, but. Uh, this one was tricky. We were we were down to about playing C or D uh, by the time we pulled it off. But it, it, it we got them married and, and they're happy and working and uh, and in their in their new place doing their new things and and uh, so we're excited for them. So that's it. Just personally, uh, I'm I'm in school at Faulkner right now. Just I took the summer off because uh, um, because of the wedding. 
But uh, I'm in school at Faulkner working on a, a PhD in humanities. Uh, my class this semester is uh, 17th century England. Uh, I like a lot of things. I love history. I was a history major in college. Um, and I like to find out how a lot of things relate to uh, our life in Christ and uh, our faith in him. Uh, so so um, I do have, I got a master's in ministry from, from Fried Hardeman, um, um, a BA from Lipscomb in, in uh history so and and i listen i've written a few things and, and recorded a few things all that preacher stuff but i thought you might uh just like to hear a little bit about me and my family before we get started so if you're ready let's uh let's start in um our theme text which is uh galatians chapter five and i want to back up just a little bit remember remember what the um uh, what the uh, main problem in the galatian letter is right the main problem in the galatian letter is that some teachers have come into these predominantly Gentile churches. And we can assume that these teachers who uh, came into uh, this um, Gentile church, we can assume, I think, that they were Jewish teachers. Um, uh, some places, uh, Paul will refer to them as Judaizers. Um, and so uh, what goes on is is the, these folks are... are um, obey the gospel and brought to Christ through Paul's preaching and the preaching of others. They become Christians and um, they are, they're doing great. As a matter of fact, you know, at one point Paul's going to say, what did hinder you? What, what, you know, what, what tripped you up? So they were doing great, but what tripped them up is these um, Jewish teachers came into these Gentile churches and began to insist that they uh, keep the law of Moses. Uh, in particular regard to circumcision for uh, the male converts and for the dietary restrictions of the law of Moses for the uh, entirety of, of the churches. And for one reason or another, instead of saying, we're not going to do that, that's not what we signed up for. You know, that's not what, what Paul told us. And and really, if you think about it, when you start the Galatian letter and he says the, there is... Uh, if, if we or an angel from heaven declare to you any other gospel than the one that we, which we have declared to you, uh, then whoever does that is cursed um, because that's what was going on. They'd already obeyed the gospel, but now they're being told that the gospel included the keeping of the mosaic restrictions of diet and, and, uh, um, and circumcision and all that. And so Paul wants to know what the hangup is. He, he wants to know why they've, they've started to do that because what creeps in as they begin to do that, is the idea that somehow they are justified by the actions of the law and they are not justified by their faith in um, Jesus Christ. And so um, that, that's where I want to start. We've got, we've got to start with the entire context of, of uh, uh, Galatians in, in mind. And then we get to our passage, which is in chapter 5, and it starts out this way. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. Because as he's been talking to them about the law of Moses now, he's talking about the fact that this, this law of, of Moses has a tendency to, to push those who are trying to be justified by works toward doing works of the flesh, and and I'm not exactly sure what that connection is, but but it is there, and he he makes that connection that that the works of the flesh are not going to justify you, but they may uh, condemn you. And here, of course, are what those those works are. And then then what he does is to to juxtapose those or set those against uh, the fruit of the spirit, as as you've heard. So the works of the flesh are evident. ESV says sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. These, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So as we look at this list of things, what we notice here is that these are works. They are they are actions. Uh, they are things that are done, okay? When we get to the uh, 
when we get to the fruit of the spirit, what we're going to notice about them is that the fruit of the spirit, and, and I almost said fruits there, but I didn't. It's not the fruits of the spirit. I know we've all seen a, uh, I know we've all seen a, a painting on somebody's wall or, or uh, maybe somebody uh, needlepoint you know, did a needlepoint project and they had a bowl of fruit and, and, you know, there was love, joy, peace, patience, and, and they were different types of fruit in this, in this bowl. Right. Um, and, and then probably the title was the fruits of the spirit. Well, this is not the fruits of the spirit. This is the fruit of the spirit. This is what grows on the tree of real, authentic spirituality. And of course, what grows on that tree of real, authentic spirituality is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and R2, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now again, the overall context of, of Galatians is it's flesh against spirit. Um, and the two parts of that argument are flesh against spirit as uh, Moses compared to Christ and as um, the fruits of a life that's dedicated, the works of a life that's dedicated to the flesh as compared to the, the fruit of a life that is dedicated to uh, a spiritual life. And so here we are in, in this passage of Scripture, and we've got these two, goodness and faithfulness. Now, what you notice uh, between or, or as you compare these two lists is, is the works of the flesh are specific actions, um, drunkenness, orgies, uh, divisions, you know, all of these things, impurity, sensuality. These, these are actions, whereas when we get down to the fruit of, of the Spirit, these things are characteristics. They are um, ideals. You don't read in them a specific action, right? It, it doesn't say feeding the, the hungry or clothing the naked or visiting with, you know, it's not a specific thing. It is a, it is a overarching characteristic that fills up the mind and heart of uh, those who dedicate their lives to living in the spirit. Now, when we get to R2, goodness and faithfulness, goodness is uh, one that we might argue, uh, as compared to all the others in the list, um, is an action, that, that goodness is doing good things. And that is a, that is a distinct possibility, uh, and we'll see that as, as we go. Uh, I do want to do a little study of, of each of the two words separately, but I don't want that to be the the uh, the you know direction of our whole thing. I want us to talk about goodness a little bit, and then faithfulness a little bit, and then I want to see what their relation is. Because the more I've thought about this over the past uh, several weeks, um, there there was a there's a story that jumps out at me where these two words are um, united, and I want I'll throw that out there now because I want you, I want to see if you can you can think of it if you can. Uh, think about that story where, where you've heard these words uh, together uh, before. All right. So uh, let's let's look at let's look at one thing, and and I'm going to talk. We'll talk about this word goodness, and then again we'll talk about uh, the idea of faithfulness, and then we'll try to uh, put them together. One of uh, my favorite stories of uh, Jesus is, and I don't know why it's my favorite. I guess it's a very powerful story. Um, but it's also a very sad story. It's in Luke chapter 18. And here's what we read. We, we talk, call this story the story of the rich young ruler. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. Now, I wanted to uh, look into that passage as we begin tonight to uh, try to understand this word good. Because this young man comes to Jesus, obviously very well educated, 
faithful practicing Jew comes to Jesus and calls him in, in, a, in an effort to be complimentary and polite. He calls him good teacher. Now, Jesus says something here um, that, or, or ask him a question. I think it's an interesting question. And I think sometimes we miss, we miss the point. Jesus is, is not saying that he's not good. Keep in mind, he asked him the question, why do you call me uh, good? You see, Jesus wanted to know how insightful this young man was. And so Jesus um, says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, see, we know the truth of the matter, right? And the truth of the matter is that Jesus is God. And so it was perfectly appropriate for this young man to call Jesus good. But I think Jesus wanted to know how much the young man got that. Did Jesus understood? Did the young man understand that when he called Jesus good, and that was a title that was applied only appropriately to God, then there's there's a logical thing. There's there's two pieces of a puzzle that need to click together there, there right? If Jesus is good, and only God is good, then Jesus is God, right? And so uh, uh, Jesus has done things like that. Uh, this is one of the, the less obvious cases, uh, but he's done things like that on, on a number of occasions. Uh, for instance, when the man is lowered down through the roof by his friends and uh, he looks down at the man who's laying there and he's crippled, he cannot get up, he's paralyzed, um, he tells that young man, your sins are forgiven you. And of course, the whispers start, right? Who, who is this to forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. Well, of course, they were right. Only God could forgive sins. Uh, what they were wrong about uh, is their misunderstanding of, of who uh, Jesus, Jesus was. And so Jesus says, hey, listen, so that you, uh, what, is it harder to to tell a man to, to walk or is it harder to forgive his sins? And uh, of course, they, they're speechless at that point. He says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, I say to you, arise and walk, right? So uh, Jesus has done that before. He did it, in, he did it in, uh, in the book of John on a number of occasions before Abraham was, I am. Uh, and here he's, he's feeling this young man out, but he, but he makes a point that is very, very relevant to our discussion. And that point is, uh, about God being good and God really being the only, the only good, okay? Now, I looked up this word goodness in our New Testaments and I, and I found out that it occurs, um, it occurs six times. Interestingly, uh, Paul is the one who uses it all six times. And as I was scrolling down through those usages of the word uh, goodness in Paul's writings, I, I thought, oh, this is going to be easy because all of these six, after the first couple, I thought, oh, this, this, I know where this is going. After the first couple, I noticed that, that they were not talking about human goodness, our goodness, but they were talking about the goodness of God. For instance, in Romans chapter 10, uh, behold the goodness and severity of God. Goodness on those uh, uh, who have heeded him. Uh, severity on those uh, who did not. Uh, so I, I thought, well, the, oh, I see where this is going. All of these words that, that Paul uses for goodness are going to apply uh, to God. It's going to be God's goodness that's talked about. But as I got a little further down the list, I, I noticed that that wasn't the case. That in fact, uh, of the six times that Paul uses the word goodness, three of those times um, refer to the goodness of God. And three of those times, one in Galatians, one in Ephesians, which is very, very similar to our Galatians passage. And then one in 2 Thessalonians, he talks about the goodness, our goodness, the goodness of, the goodness of uh, uh, God's people. Now, that needs to um, make sense to us for this reason, that, that we need to understand that there is truth, that only God is good, but at the same time, there is, there, there is an, another truth, and that is 
that goodness is something that, that we can love. And because it's a part of God's nature, any goodness that we have is going to be derivative from God's goodness. And, and, and so we, we can't get puffed up or, or arrogant about our goodness. Listen, our goodness, and, and I think it was Jeremiah or Isaiah, I don't remember, one of, the, one of, the, one of those prophets talked about um, our righteousness, righteousnesses, he uses that word, it's a really interesting word, righteousnesses, are but filthy rags. You know, if you had to, if you had to add up all of our goodness, it wouldn't amount to much. But our goodness is not ours in a sense. It is derivative from God. So, so when Jesus says there's none, none good but God, that's true, okay? But when we talk about our goodness, we're talking about a derivative goodness. Um, we, may, we even might say an imputed goodness. Um, although it is derived from God, it is still something that we may acquire or attain, uh, now, of course, we've we got to be like Paul who says, listen, uh, I don't uh, count myself to have attained um, except one thing, forgetting what's past. Well, what was in his past? Well, his sinfulness, his being away, his being away from God. But, but I do think that this passage over here in, um, in Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 9, uh, is an important passage that I, I think shows us the relationship between those truths. Those truths being that God is good and goodness that we have is derived from our relationship to God. When we get to the, the great practical chapter of, of uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, we read this in verse 9. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. And so I want to suggest to you that perhaps this is the way that we attain the goodness of, of this passage, that we abhor what is evil, works of the flesh, and cling to what is good. Uh, and so a goodness that is derived from God, a righteousness that is Christ, that we cling to what is good. What is good? Well, God is good. So as we cling to God, that goodness rubs off on us is a manner, manner of speaking. Maybe not the best manner of speaking, but, but you get my point that uh, we don't build our own righteousness. We don't build our own, our own resume. Goodness belongs to God. We have it by relation to him as we abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Okay. Now, the Romans 12 passage uh, introduces our next concept, and that is uh, the concept or the characteristic of faithfulness. So listen, abhor what is evil, cling, cling, hold on to goodness. Okay, so, so notice how, how in this verse, uh, goodness and faithfulness are related. Goodness and faithfulness are always related. Uh, doing good and faithfulness are always related. You, you, you honestly, you can't have one without the other. It's almost that goodness is the definition of faithfulness and faithfulness is the definition of goodness. If that, I'll let you that run around in your head a little bit. It's been running around in my head uh, all week. Goodness is the definition of faithfulness and faithfulness is the definition of goodness. Uh, they go together. Uh, they, they, stand, they stand incomplete almost without the other. You know, anybody can do good. Um, randomly. Goodness is, is clinging to that which is good, and clinging to that which is good is faithfulness. Now, one thing that I, that I told you just a few minutes ago as we were, we were getting started is uh, the idea that goodness is derivative from God. God is good, right? And I want to tell you the same thing is true about, about faithfulness that faithfulness is derivative from, from God. Let me just read you a, a few uh, passages. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Let me find you some more. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, a very, very important verse. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful. 2 Corinthians 1, 18, but as God is faithful. And, and really, you go, you go down through a bunch, a bunch of these verses. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. 2 Thessalonians um, 3, 3. But the Lord is faithful. You see, almost all the references, just, just like uh, half, half the references uh, to goodness were about uh, God and half the references to goodness were about men, same is almost true of faithfulness. That, that half of it is about our faithfulness and half of it is about God's faithfulness, which reestablishes this connection that I suggested to you already, that as goodness is derivative from the nature and character of God, and that's why we have it, that's why we are, we are gifted with it, then faithfulness is also derived from the, from the um, character and nature of God. Now, that... that don't let that confuse us a little bit. You know, there are practical things, and we're going to talk about those in just a minute. There are practical things that we have to do that relate both to goodness and to faithfulness. But anything that we ever have that is good or ever do that is good is a participation in the goodness of God. Anything that is good is related to God who is goodness itself, if that, if that makes any sense. And that's kind of blowing my mind here for a minute. You know, I think even about God creating the world. You know, what did he do? Every time he created something, he spoke it into existence. And then he looked at it and he said, what? It is good. It is good. It is good. Why was it good? It was good because he made it. It was good because it was derived from him. It was good because of its relationship to him. So when we talk about, about goodness, you know, let's not get hung up on this uh, idea of, of, of establishing a righteousness of our own, but deriving our righteousness from our relationship to God who is good and maintaining that relationship because God is faithful. And so goodness and faithfulness are related, not just uh, by their, uh, not just by their uh, listing order, in uh, Galatians chapter 5, but by the fact that one is almost uh, defined by the other and vice versa, and both are derived from the nature and the character of God. And before our time gets away from us, and it is getting away pretty quickly, uh, I want to go to Matthew chapter 25. And here's the story. Anybody, anybody remember it yet? Yeah. Maybe when I said Matthew 25, uh, you thought of it. Matthew chapter 25 we have uh, Jesus telling a parable. And you know the parable. It's the parable of the talents. And maybe for the sake of time, we will, uh, uh, I'll just give you the, the nuts and bolts of it. You know, it says a man, uh, it will be like a man who's going on his journey. He called his servants, three of them by number, and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, and then he went away. He gave them these talents according to their ability, and according to their ability is an important uh, line there. He who had received the first talents went at once, traded with them. He made five talents more. So also he had the two talents, made two talents more. So also he, uh, but he, but he who received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he came, and he who had received the five talents came forward. And you remember what he did, right? How many did he make? He made five more. Guy with two talents came forward. I made two more. The man with the one talent came forward and says, um, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed, so I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground, and here you have what is yours. But his master answered and said, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. You should have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to everyone who has give it to him who has ten talents. And of course, uh, 
cast the worthless servant into outer darkness in the place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right. Now, do you remember the line um, from the story that I haven't said yet? But when the master comes to take accounts of these three men, the first two men are, are met with these, their efforts are met with these words. You know what they are, right? Here's what he says. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Good and faithful. What made him a good servant? It was faithful. What made him a faithful servant? He was good. See, see the relationship there? That you, you almost can't separate the two because he could not have been one without being the other. They went together. You cannot be good without being faithful. You cannot be faithful without being good. Those two, uh, just stay, you know, they, they exist. They coexist. Well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, that's, that's the words that we want to hear, right? The very words that we want to hear when we meet our Heavenly Father. Well done, good and faithful servant. I do want to pull, uh, since we've got just a few minutes left, a, a point or two that I've been thinking about that related to those words. What made him, what makes us good and faithful servants? Okay, here's one. The first is that we understand the nature of our master, okay? You know what the, the third servant says? He says, I knew that you were a shrewd man. I knew that you harvest where you hadn't planted, that you reap where you haven't sowed. And I went and I hid it because I was, you know, because I knew this about you. Well, what he knew about the master is completely opposite from what he did, right? But... The implication there is is this, or the deduction, I guess, that we could that we can decide is that if this servant knew that about his master, then the two faithful servants, the five talent man, the two talent man, they knew that as well. They understood their master. Now that's really important, remember, because where where does goodness and faithfulness come from? It comes from God. Those are characteristics of his nature. If, if it has good, it's because of God. If it has faithfulness, it's, it's because of God. So, so one of the things that is going to make us good and faithful servants is to understand the nature and character of our master. Okay? We don't know God. We can't be good uh, because Goodness is derived from him. Faithfulness derived from him. So the first thing that made this servant or these two servants good and faithful was that they understood their master. Now, the second thing that made them faithful is that uh, made them good and faithful is that in addition to understanding their master, they also understood stewardship. They, they understood that something was being put into their hands for a purpose. Not only were they to care for that thing and present it back to their master when he returned, but they were to invest that thing in opportunities around them. We're told, uh, and I made quite a deal of it as we went through uh, just a moment ago, that, that they were given these talents according to their abilities. Well, what do they need ability for? They need ability because they are to invest these talents in the opportunities that they have with the expectation of them bearing fruit, them being productive, them um, increasing. And so, and, and we could go on, I, I guess one more thing that we ought to say about this, uh, again, before time gets away from us, is that uh, another thing that differentiated or separated the good and faithful servant from the uh, wicked servant was that the wicked servant acted out of fear, right? 
I knew this about you, and I was afraid. I was afraid to take a chance. I was afraid to stick my neck out. I was, I was afraid to do what it is I knew you expected me to do. And so as we look at that story, and, and I don't want this to be a complete you know, rendering of, of this great parable, but, but it was a parable that I thought we had to look at because of the, the conjunction in the words of the master, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. Uh, and, you know, I think that that is uh, uh, really important, right? When are you going to see those words together again? When are you going to hear these words good and faithful together again? When you hear the master say them, if you've understood him, if you have uh, understood the responsibility of stewardship, taking care of the opportunities and blessings and abilities that he's given you, if you have not lived your life in fear of doing those things, um, of embracing his nature, that makes goodness and faithfulness possible. Of course, the um, end results are um, dependent on whether or not we have laid hold of goodness and faithfulness. The end result of the um, wicked servant was that he was cast into outer darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the end result of the two faithful servants who had faithfully used uh, what they had been entrusted is enter into the joy of your master. And that's certainly what I want to hear. And I know that's what you want to hear as well. Of course, we couldn't leave uh, this passage without uh, thinking about what uh, the Lord told those persecuted Christians in the opening chapters of um, the book of Revelation. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Goodness and faithfulness go together. They go hand in hand. They're derived from the very nature of God himself, and yet we can participate in them by dedicating our life to his spirit and producing uh, in our life committing our lives to the production of those fruits um, that we've been studying all summer and goodness and faithfulness that we've been studying tonight. God bless you. Thanks for having me once again. Hope everything goes well with Woodstock Church in the weeks to come, and I hope to see you soon.